and his faithfulness. Because your covenant love is great, it reaches heaven high, and your unfailing faithfulness extends up to the sky. Our God's love is beyond our ability to comprehend. Just how high are the heavens, and where exactly do they end? This is the God that we have come to praise this morning. Let's stand to sing and praise to our God and remain standing for the invocation. Lord, we praise you, for you have done marvelous things. Your right hand and your holy arm have worked salvation for us. You have made known your salvation. You have revealed your righteousness in the sight of the nations. You have remembered your steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen your salvation. And Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. We thank you for his victory over sin and death on our behalf. We thank you for new life in him, for making us alive together with Christ. We ask for your help this morning in this service of worship. Stir our hearts to praise you with heartfelt gratitude and joy. Unite our hearts together as a congregation as we bring you praise. May all that's said and done in this worship service glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Our first scripture reading today comes from Exodus chapter 34, verses 1 through 8. And as you turn there in your Bibles, I'll have a few words. I'll remind you of the context. In Exodus chapter 32, uh, Moses came down Mount Sinai with the two stone tablets that had the Ten Commandments inscribed on them uh, to find that the Israelites were uh, worshiping a golden calf that they had fashioned for themselves. 
In chapter 3, Moses mediates and intercedes on behalf of the Israelites, asking God to restore that broken relationship between him and his people. And late in chapter 33, that Moses asks to see God's glory. And that's where we pick up in chapter 34. We see God's response. Note in particular what the Lord says to Moses as the Lord passes before him. Exodus 34, verses 1 through 8. Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready by the morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you, and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation? And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. This ends the reading of this portion of God's word. We continue in worship by singing Psalm 25, Selection B. In this psalm, we profess God's love and confess our sin. We profess God's love in verse 10, which says, All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Note that even under the gospel of reconciliation, the the gospel of peace and Christ's reconciliation, God's moral law still holds value for us. It guides us. It shows us the way that we should go. And it shows us our sin before a holy God. We ask God to pardon our sin in verse 11. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Let's sing in praise to our God and in confession of our sin. Please stand.
Next, we will sing Psalm 43, Selection A, and we will remain seated to sing this psalm. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we do uh, praise you for your steadfast love and for your unfailing faithfulness, of which we have already sung about this, this morning. Lord, we praise you that you speak the truth, you declare what is right. We thank you for giving us your word and for the illumination that it gives us, showing us how to live in a dark world. We thank you that we can pray to you with boldness, freedom, and confidence. And Lord, we ask that you would answer these following requests according to your will and for our good. Lord, we, we pray this morning for spiritual growth. We ask that you would cause us to grow spiritually. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would cultivate a deeper love for your word within us. Help us to take time to be in your word each day. Instruct us, warn us, comfort and encourage us. And Lord, use your word to equip us for every good work. Lord, we ask that you would teach us to pray. Help us to draw near to your throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Help us to pray in faith, resting on your promises and submitting our wills to yours. Lord, help us to share the gospel of Christ with those that are around us. Lord, each one of us has people in our lives that do not know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Family members, friends, co-workers, neighbors. Lord, hear now the prayers of your people as we lift up to you silently those people who do not yet know you. Lord, we pray that you would uphold those among us who are feeling discouraged as they go through difficulties in life. Lord, as you have promised, be near to them. Bring comfort and encouragement. 
Uphold them, defend them, protect them, and provide for them. We pray specifically for wisdom for the judge who will be making decisions in Logan and Mandy's hearing. Grant that judge clarity of the situation. Grant him wisdom to know what's right, what's right in your eyes. Lord, give him the conviction to follow that right path. Lord, hear now the prayers of you of your people as we lift up to you silently the needs of those who need your encouragement. Lord, we also know of some in our midst who are struggling with their physical strength and health. We ask that you would continue to provide healing for Cynthia as she recovers from her recent surgeries. Lord, we thank you for sustaining David Mills this week. We thank you for how quickly he has regained his strength. And Lord, hear now the prayers of your people as we lift up to you silently the needs of others we know who have health needs. Bless Joel as he brings your message to us this morning through the book of 2 John. Speak to us through him. Use your word and your message in a powerful way in our lives that we might walk in the truth. Transform us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. How's this? All right. It's good to be with you here. You can turn to 2 John in your Bible. 2 John near the very end of Scripture, Revelation, the last book. Before that, you've got Jude. Before that is 3 John. Uh, And then guess what? 2 John comes right before 3 John. It's a short book, but hopefully you can find it there. And as you turn to 2 John, let me just make a few comments uh, on sort of where I'm headed in my preaching and a few other things. One thing that's very clear to me as I come and begin a preaching ministry here is that I'm stepping into a pulpit that has been well used. Uh, I was told this week that this pulpit is the pulpit that the church has used really ever since its beginning, uh, which means I'm stepping into a pulpit from which many uh, wonderful sermons have been preached. I know in my own life I I was blessed in the times I got to hear Andy preach through the years, various times, conferences, and that sort of thing. So I know for uh, those of you who have been here, uh, you have heard the Word of God preached to you in power, uh, and my prayer is that I simply step in and continue uh, to bring the Word of God to you in power and in love uh, and with boldness. I'll note with my preaching, as uh, you know, the end of March for our family really is a time of transition for us. We're still living in Indianapolis, though I think I was uh, down here in Columbus five days this week, so I'm uh, more and more finding Columbus to be home, and I uh, am very eager for my home address to become Columbus, and I'm uh, eager to continue to get to know you all, but in this uh, final few weeks of March, I'm going to be preaching Second John. Uh, I preached Second John when I was in Second RP, so it's good for me to have something I've uh, gone to before during this very busy time, 
Uh, so we'll do 2 John for two weeks, uh, another uh, book that really gives us the foundations of the Christian life. Well, last week we did Christ and Him crucified as the uh, real purpose of the church, and we want to uh, carry on with the foundations of the Christian life that John gives us here. Uh, and then beginning in uh, April, I'll begin preaching in the book of Mark. And I'll be in Mark, and I'll be in there for quite a while. That will sort of be the first full-length kind of uh, book that I preach, and that will begin uh, once I move here to Columbus. But enough preliminaries on all of that. Uh, we'll read 2 John 1 through 6. I'll pray before we read. Lord, we pray for your grace, uh, your mercy, and your peace to be with us in truth and love, uh, even when we would consider a text about exactly that. Uh, we pray that you would teach us from your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. 2 John, the first six verses. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. This is the word of God. Well, what if I gave you a writing assignment this morning? Some of you might be worried to hear about that, and you don't need to be too worried. Grading papers is not on my job description. But what if I gave you this writing assignment? What if I asked you to take a half sheet of paper, about the size of your bulletin or the back side of your bulletin, and I said, as much as you can put on just that one half sheet of paper, write the message or the truths that you would hope the church or your family would remember and carry on after you die? What would you put on a half sheet of paper that would be your message, really, to the church or the family or the world? This is what really, really matters. Some of you might think, well, I know what I need to title that. I heard your sermon last week. You put on the top, Christ and Him Crucified. But what would you fill out as something that really uh, would summarize the truths uh, that need to be carried on from one generation to the next? I would actually love to read what some of you would write out. Some of you, I think, would probably write your personal testimony, maybe, of how you came to faith in Jesus. Some of you might say, well, maybe I should write something like the Apostles' Creed or the first answer to the Shorter Catechism or something like that. Maybe some of you would have no idea what to write, and it'd be a blank page, and you'd have questions. What really matters? What really would I put on a piece of paper as something that should be preserved for generations? Well, in a very real sense, Second John is the Apostle John's half sheet of paper for us. You could probably fit Second John, if you wrote small enough, on the back of your bulletin. And here is John. He has a lot of things he would like to say to the people. If you look at verse 12 of the book, he says, I have much to write to you, but I don't want to use too much paper. I want to come see you face to face. So what 2 John is, is the boiled down version of here's what you really need to know right here, right now. So your call this morning is to listen to the Apostle John. What would this one who walked with Jesus Christ put down as urgent for you to know this morning? What would he put down, not simply as his personal opinion, but as the inspired word of God for you to know and really embrace as God's call in your life? Here are some of the kinds of questions that you'll actually find John dealing with in these 12, 13 verses we'll consider in two weeks. Questions like, how does God relate to man? How do I get along with my fellow Christians? 
more next week. Where do I go when the truths of the Bible don't seem so true anymore? For John, these are urgent questions. Questions that must be answered. Questions that we just need answers to. You need answers to those questions, don't you? They may not be the most complicated questions you've ever thought of, but they're pretty important. And what we'll find this morning is John frames the whole thing on the concepts of truth and love. Truth and love. The word truth appears verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4. The word love is there in verse 1, verse 3, verse 5, and verse 6. And sometimes in our culture, uh, you might get a dichotomy where you have some people who are all about truth and some people who are all about love. You've got the truth tellers and the people that want to just love and relate well to people. For John, these two just come right together. We're the people of truth and love. Jesus is church. Jesus is family. Columbus Reformed Presbyterian Church must thrive as a church of truth and love. That's the message we have this morning. We'll see it in three parts. A people of truth and love in three parts. First, we'll see that we're a truth and love family, verses 1 and 2. Then we'll see a truth and love God, verse 3. And then a truth and love walk, verses 4 through 6. Truth and love family, truth and love God, truth and love walk. First, we are the truth and love family, verses 1 and 2. How do you start a letter? How might you start a letter to people that you don't know personally, or many there you wouldn't know personally? How would you start a letter like that where you're trying to communicate love? John does it in a very interesting way. My guess is none of you, if you wrote your half sheet of paper, would quite start it like John does, but listen how he does it. The elder to the elect lady and her children. The elder to the elect lady and her children. Now, some of you may be saying, well, John never even put his name here. How do you know this is the Apostle John? Well, the early church always confessed this as the letter of John. You look at the style of the book. It's very similar, right in line with the book of John and 1 John and 3 John. It seems clear that this is the Apostle John. But what John wants to emphasize is not his name, but the family language The family identity of those he's writing to. John introduces himself as an elder. He's a father in the faith. And he writes to the lady and her children. As if he's writing to a young mom sitting on her couch with her children surrounding her, opening a letter from a dear grandfather they haven't heard from in a long, long time. I'm reading a biography of the missionary and athlete Eric Little. And when he was about seven or eight years old, his parents were missionaries in China, he was sent to Scotland for school. And the next ten years of his life, the relationship with his parents was built on letters. He saw them one or two times in the next ten years. And some of you may think, well, that's how in the world could you do that? Well, Little actually grew up and said, I want to be just like my parents when I grew up. grow up. And he lived a life he followed in their footsteps. And for him, letters from a distance, somehow it worked. And for John, he's writing this letter to this lady and her children. And he's communicating who they are. Now what you need to discover is this morning, the lady and the children, in a very real sense, is actually us. It doesn't seem that John is actually writing to an individual woman and her children surrounding her. This book deals with issues that appear in the life of the church. It deals with the the carrying on of the church of Jesus Christ. You might think of the book of Revelation, which John himself wrote by inspiration of the Spirit. It speaks of a woman who is pursued by a dragon into the wilderness, and the woman is a picture of the church. The elect lady here is the bride of Jesus Christ. The lady is the church of God and the children are the members. They were born into the church, if you will. They've experienced a new birth. So what you have is this father in the faith that's writing to the church, to the bride of Christ, to the children born into the church. 
And what you discover is John's family language is impressing upon you and me our identity of who we are as the church. We are a family born by the Spirit, born into the family of God. That's what it means to be part of the church. If you're a member of a fitness club, you don't get this kind of language uh, applied to you. You are now part of the elect lady and the children of the fitness club. That'd just be a little odd, wouldn't it? Your homeowners association, when they send you your dues, doesn't talk to you as members of the elect lady and their children. They just tell you to sign a check. And sometimes in life, maybe we start to think about our membership in the church in sort of those kind of categories. It's just some organization that I happen to go to on Sunday mornings. But John says, no. You're the bride of Christ. You are the children of God. You are, we are a family. Now, that might sound nice to call our, uh, each other family and have a sense, I guess, in some kind of way we're a family together. The question is, well, says who or what makes us a family? John's answer, love and truth. Love and truth. John, verse 1, that tells the lady and her children, I love you. Who might love in truth, and not only John loves the lady, uh, but all who know the truth. The whole church of Jesus Christ loves the church of Jesus Christ. The church across the world, John is saying to this individual church or group of churches, you are loved. It's a worldwide family of love. Now, some of you hear that, and maybe you wonder, well, has John been listening to music from the 60s? Uh, this idea, all you need is love. You know, love makes the world go around, and just we're just one big, happy family. We all love each other. We have, hear this kind of messaging, actually a decent amount in our world. The idea of just, we're all part of a family of love. John's speaking about something much deeper than that. He's not just speaking of feelings of niceness as sort of passed from person to person around the world. John's speaking of a grounded love, a love with deep foundations. I remember as a kid playing on my grandparents' basketball court that my grandfather had built in his backyard. And I remember my dad always saying, my grandpa wanted to take it very seriously. He said he put the concrete so deep that you could land a helicopter on that court. It's got deep foundations. The foundations of our love, you could land a helicopter on it. It's grounded on something. What is it grounded on? The truth. I love you in truth, John says. Not only I love you in truth, all who know the truth. Verse 2, what is the foundation? There's a truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. We are a family of love because of the truth that abides in us. But maybe you still have a question. How does truth make us family? A lot of times we think of truths as maybe abstract concepts or just things that happened or things that are real, and that often doesn't make us feel like family. The fact that uh, the sun rose at 745 this morning doesn't fill you with warm, fuzzy feelings of love. It's true, but how does that create love? Or even historic truths don't always necessarily unite us together in love. The fact that George Washington was the first president of the United States doesn't guarantee that those who also know the truth feel like family. It's just so what does it mean? What does it mean for us as a church to say, well, we're a family, we're the elect lady and her children because we know truth? How does that make us family? Look how John talks about truth. He's not talking about facts. They are facts. He's talking about more than facts. He's talking about living reality. He's not just talking about ideas like the sunrise or the history of our nation. For him, he says, truth is something that abides in us. And will be with us forever. That's the verse 2 language. 
He talks about truth as the very living reality of God that it comes and dwells in us and is with us and makes us come alive. That's far deeper than some fact that you read in the newspaper tomorrow morning. Now, how does that work? How is truth making us come alive? And how is truth abiding in us? Work with me for a minute on this. It's helpful here to read, the broad, read and think about the broader writings of the Apostle John. John talks about truth in John and 1 John and 2 John and other places as well. Truth for John is the very living reality of God. Some of you might know John chapter 1, Jesus came and he was full as he came of grace and of truth. Or John chapter 8, Jesus talking uh, talking about himself says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus isn't there just talking about bare facts, he's talking about knowing Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. We look at John 14, 16, Jesus speaking of his departure to glory. And he says that the spirit of truth will come and will be with you forever. Same language of 2 John uh, verse 2. John 14, 17, the spirit of truth is the one who dwells with you and will be in you. The Spirit of God is the truth, John says in 1 John 5, 6. When John speaks about truth, he's not talking about abstract concepts. He's talking about the reality of God coming to us in the person of Jesus Christ and poured out on the church through the Spirit. You see, the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever is Quite simply, God himself come to us and made us alive through the Spirit. We talk about being the children of God. John chapter 3, we're born of the Spirit. And so the reality here is that we are those, when we say the truth abides in us, we're not simply saying we believe a series of facts about Christian history. We do. We're not simply saying we believe that God is or that God is uh, loving. We believe that. But when we say that the truth abides in us, we're saying that God has come to us. We're saying that the Spirit is present. We, as a local body of Christ, can say the truth abides in us. The Spirit has come to us. We are alive because of what has come to us in truth. And I hope what you see is that makes us family. We've all been born at the same place. We've all been born at the same hospital together through the Spirit poured out on us to make us come alive. And John wants you to know this morning, don't just think about it as though we, this local church, are part of the family. John says, look, Look what you've become a part of. It's not just I who love you in truth. Everybody who knows the truth loves you. That can be really comforting for small churches or mid-sized churches or large churches, wherever you are, whatever we would be. We're part of something much bigger. We're part of something much bigger than what you can see with your eyes this morning. We're part of the worldwide church that, is, uh, that the truth dwells in. We're the family of God in love and truth. What you need to know this morning, before you really get a charge or a command, that comes verse 4 through 6. It's just to believe that you are loved. Believe that we are a place of love and of truth. That it's not just John who loves this individual church, but that we are the loved people of God. But there is a worldwide family that we're a part of that's greater than you can imagine. At Second RP, a few months ago, uh, our past, the pastor there, James, uh, went to South Sudan 
uh, on a uh, explore, not exploratory, a visit, visitation kind of mission uh, trip to visit the fellow missionaries there and encourage the church. He was talking with one man in the a church there in South Sudan, and James started sharing about how in the 80s or the 90s, his family had been praying for believers there in Sudan, praying that God would strengthen them and uphold them and protect them. The man looked James back in the eye and said, you know what, I am the answer to your prayers. There's a unity. There's a, a worldwide experience, a sense of family bond that we have with the broader church we are the family of God. We are a truth and love family. And in some ways, this point has already moved forward to the idea of the second idea, second point here. What really makes us a truth and love family is our experience, secondly, of the truth and love God. The truth and love God, verse 3. We've seen already how verse 2 is at least uh, referencing or implying the work of the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, uh, John takes us to God Himself. The Apostle John speaks often of the Trinity. Verse 2 would uh, it'd be true in us through the Spirit. Now verse 3, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son. In what? In truth and love. In truth and love. Spirit, Father, Son. It might be hard to do, but for a minute, just contemplate how from all eternity, the Father, the Spirit, and the Son have dwelled together in truth and love. Eternally, the God of ultimate truth, ultimate reality, Nothing contradictory, nothing false about the character of God Himself. The Father, Son, and Spirit dwelling together in truth, dwelling together in love. The bond of love from all eternity of the Father, the Spirit, the Son together. An overflow of constant love, one for each other. And now here is John writing to a church. We don't even know their names. We don't even know who they are. And he says, you know that truth? You know that love of the Father and the Son? That truth and love comes to you. The truth and love of all etern from all eternity of God Himself is now poured out. And who receives it? Who receives it? The best people God could find to participate in the triune blessing. The most wonderful people around that he thought could be invited to glory. No. People who need what? Grace and mercy. People who would need the very gift of grace. What is grace? The gift of the goodness of God for those who don't deserve it. What is mercy? God turning his, sin, uh, his wrath away from sinners who would deserve all of His punishment. Pouring it out on the person of Jesus Christ so what? We would receive His love. And when we've received His grace and His mercy, we receive the very peace of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The God of truth and love comes to sinners like you comes to sinners like me and offers His truth and love to us through grace, mercy, and peace. That's what grounds your identity this morning. Our identity is not that we found the truth. You know, we're the smartest people in Columbus, Indiana. We really know what truth is. We really know. We really understand things. Or it's not that we're really wonderful people who really know how to love each other. So we're the community of truth and love because we know the truth and we know love and that, that's who we are. Well, I hope we are the people of truth and love. But what grounds our identity is that the God of truth and love comes to us who don't deserve any of it. And what does He do? Grace, 
mercy, and peace. And why? Why does the God of truth and love from all eternity choose to show people like you and me grace, mercy, and peace? Because he loves us. You say, well, why does he love us? Because he loves us. We, we can't really press much farther than that. Because God is greater than you can possibly imagine. Because his truth and his love, that's our hope. He puts his stamp on us and says, I want to love you. I have loved you. And notice John speaking in the future tense. You will receive it. You have not emptied this morning. You might feel like there's trials in your life this morning. You may feel like your sin is too great this morning. And maybe you've emptied out the bottle of truth and love that you, you get to experience for life. There's not much left because you've already exhausted the supply. John says, oh no. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you. It's coming. I don't know what it's going to look like exactly in your life, but it's going to be the God of truth and love showing to you, to us, his grace, mercy, and peace. And so what we get to discover is that we are. Our identity is much deeper and greater than there is love across the church. That's where John starts. John says, I love you, and everyone in the church loves you. John says, God loves you. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And so we become those who claim the Trinity. If you want to know why You can believe and carry on in the faith. Claim the Trinity. Claim who God is, Father, Son, and Spirit, and claim what He has done for you and for us. One theologian says the Holy Trinity is the heart and core of our confession, the earmark of our religion, the praise and comfort of all true believers in Christ. That's what John's saying. By the Spirit, the truth abides in us, Grace, mercy, and peace from the Father and the Son. So then what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to believe it. We're supposed to know that we are the family of God. We're supposed to embrace what God has done to us in Jesus Christ. Christ and Him crucified, of course. And that leads us thirdly to a truth and love walk. A truth and love walk, verses 4 through 6. Verse 4. 1 to 3, God is truth and love come to us. Verse 4 through 6, walk in truth and love and reflect your God. Put the Trinity on display, you might say. Put the character of God on display to the world. John uses that walk phrase or word twice. Verse 4, it's there, walking in the truth. Verse 6, love is walking in the commandments. You walk in the way that God has called you has called you to live. That's really what the Christian life is all about. Seeing your identity and then walking in it. Seeing who you are, that's verses 1 to 3, and then go live like it. Verses 4 through 6, some theologians just say it like this, the indicative... What is indicated to be true about you leads to the imperative. What is commanded to be true about you. You have received truth and love, so go walk. And guess what? Truth and love. Because you and me, we were made to reflect God himself. So let's get walking. Let's start walking. Let's put on our shoes, our running shoes, our walking shoes, and let's start walking in the direction we're called to walk. It begins verse 4, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth. Now, the implication here is this is what you are to continue to do, but notice how John frames it as an encouragement. I'm encouraged by how I see some of you walking. Now, what does it mean to walk in the truth? Maybe you know what it would mean to take a walk in the park or take a walk Uh, You know, walk through the sanctuary on the way out to your car. But what does it mean to walk in the truth? The idea of walking really refers to the whole direction of your life. 
the whole consuming orientation on which you are walking. My cousin uh, walked the entire Pacific Coast Trail uh, along California up into Oregon and that whole area, 2,600 miles or so. Many, many months of walking. You can imagine his entire life His living, his eating, his moving consumed constantly with the walking of that trail. There really wasn't much else going on in his life, you might say. And John is saying, you live, you eat, you breathe, you walk in the truth. The truth, what did we say the truth was? The reality of God among us. Father, Son, and Spirit come to us. His person, His character come to us. He is our life. And we walk in the truth that He has revealed to us. And this is very practical. As we carry on in 2 John next week, we'll discover that there's great concern that there are those who are rejecting the truth coming to the church, and there are those who are tempted to reject the truth as well. And John says, oh no, just keep walking in the truth of God. In our own culture, there are so many that would oppress intellectual arguments, arguments against the truth. Perhaps even in our day, arguing that truth is just a, just a metaphor, just a way of talking. You go to the college campuses, you're going to find this, and this very hardcore idea that there's truth to walk in, they'll say, Well, it doesn't make any sense. There's no truth you could walk in. What you say is, you know what? God is truth. I know Him. And I'm made to reflect His character. So I'm going to keep walking. I'm going to keep walking. If any of you are struggling on that point, it's a challenge. You can, in your own mind, start to wonder. You can, in your own mind, start to doubt, is God really true? We want to work with you, talk with you, pray with you, walk in the truth with you. Never forget that the truth we're announcing is God, Father, Son, and Spirit come to us. That Christ has revealed the truth. And there will be challenges, but you can keep walking. I want to mention here, there is perhaps it's a subtle observation John makes, but perhaps it's also challenging for us. Verse 4, he says... Some of your children are walking in the truth. He has great joy as he thinks about some of the children walking in truth. And like John, many of us would have the same reason to rejoice. We could say, I can think of the children of God. I can think of those of you who are here who are walking in the truth. But you can hear in John's voice a longing, can't you? The knowledge that not all the children are walking in the truth. That there are those who are already straying. Some of you probably read verse 4 with a little bit of sorrow. Because you too rejoice that some, and only some of the children are walking in the truth. Maybe it's your own children. Maybe it's the children of the church. Maybe it's others you know that have strayed from the truth. And verse 4 would call us to pray and to long for more of our children to walk in the truth. Remember verse 3 in the future tense. Grace, mercy, and peace is not over. Children can be called back to the truth. It might help you this morning as you think about those you would long to walk in the truth to remember what John did at the cross. The Gospels are pretty clear. The disciples fled. The disciples were hiding in the upper room. They weren't getting it. Now here's John writing Scripture that we're still reading today. Those who stumble away from the truth can come back to the truth. By the grace, mercy, and peace of God and truth and love. And as we would walk in the truth, that leads us then to what? Walking in love. Walking in love, verse 5 and 6. Just as God is the God of truth and we stick with the truth, God is the God of love, so we love each other. The basic idea, verse 5 and 6. 
This is, I ask you, dear lady, not as though I am writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Basically says the same thing in verse 6. But I want you to see verse 5, sort of the grammatical construction John offers here. He says, I ask you, dear lady, he's got that parenthetical comment, I ask you, dear lady, that we love one another. If any of you teach grammar, you've had a bit of a challenge reading that. Shouldn't it say, you love one another? What do you mean, I'm asking you that we love? But you see, John is including himself in the command. He's not excluding. He's not saying, how about you guys go figure out this love thing? He's saying, let us figure it out. Let us love together. Let our love as the church of Christ together actually reflect the love of God to us. He's loved us so much in Jesus. Let us love one another. He says in verse 5 and 6, speaks of this as the commandment, the new commandment, the commandment that's been from the beginning but is new because of what's new for us in Christ. This is the basics, guys, he says. What are you called to this week, he's saying? You're called to love, to walk in the love, Just as for my cousin, his life of eating and breathing and drinking, and all he did was walking in the direction of that trail up through California. For you and for me, it has to be every single orientation, every single relationship has to be oriented toward the walk of love that reflects God's love. And this is where it starts to become challenging, isn't it? You can speak of the high, glorious truth of God's trinity from all eternity loving and then loving us. And then you and me are called to love as well. That's where it starts to get hard. And some of you would say, you know, it sounds like how the church is supposed to be. It sounds like how my marriage is supposed to be. But on the day-to-day, it seems like we fall short. We don't tend to, do we reflect the triune God? We're reflecting somewhere, something else. Where's the challenge going to be for you this week on this area? Where's it going to be really hard for the character of the triune God to show up in your relationships with each other? Maybe it is in your marriage. Maybe you do find yourself pulling your hair out over what's taking place. Maybe it is in another relationship. You think, well, just in that one relationship, I'm not sure I can actually love that person. John would say, I ask you that we love one another. And maybe you say, but I've got a I've got hundred excuses. I've got a hundred reasons not to love that person. Our personalities don't fit. The way that we uh, think of life doesn't fit well together. They haven't fixed any of their pet peeves that tend to bug me so much. John says, well, I, I ask you. I ask you that we love each other. Maybe it won't appear in personal relationship. Maybe it shows up in the church, the church local, the church at large. How tragic it is when the tensions and the stresses of the life of the church seem to win out at times over the love of God shown to us in Jesus Christ. Sometimes you get in the middle of the strain, in the middle of the frustration, and you have to ask, where is the love? that reflects the triune God? Where is the love that overflows in grace and mercy and peace? Where is the love that sees hurting people for who they are? Where is the love that causes the world to say, you know, that's a place that puts the Father, the Son, and the Spirit on display? You say, well, I don't know if I can show that love. I think I'm going to need some grace and mercy and peace to show love to those around me. Amen. Amen. It will only be the character of God funneling through us that will allow us to live that life of love for each other. But what an opportunity. What an opportunity to ha- you have to love those whom God has loved. In the 1860s, a new pastor arrived in a Dutch town. His name, you may have heard of it, is, was Abraham Kuyper. 
He was the new pastor in town. His one problem was he was unconverted. He didn't truly believe in the Lord at that time, but even unconverted pastors were obligated to engage in pastoral visitation. There was one particular pocket of the town he was in that was very reformed, very committed uh, to their faith, and there was a, a woman there. Her name was Pietronella Baltus. Quite a name, Pietronella Baltus. She was so zealous for the truth. He knew, she knew this guy. She knew he wasn't a true believer. So he showed up and she, she purposed to slam the door in his face. I have no interest in pastoral visitation from one who is not walking with the Lord. But then a neighbor came over to her house and said, you know what? Mr. Kuiper has an immortal soul. and He's traveling to eternity. Baltus was convicted of her sin, decided to show love to the unconverted pastor. Over and over again, she welcomed him into her house, gave him hospitality, and showed him the love of Christ while he ta she taught him the truth of Christ. I would have loved to be there for those evangelistic encounters. And this great intellect, one of the great minds of the day, came to faith because of one woman who showed love and proclaimed the truth. Kuiper went on to be one of the great stalwarts of the faith in a contentious world proclaiming the truth and love of Jesus Christ for decades. And the reality is you and me may not be that person. But you and me this morning can become and be the one who walks in love together as a church, proclaims the truth and believes it, and trusts that God will do the rest. Let's pray. Lord, our words of truth and of love are feeble and weak. Your words of truth and love are powerful and strong. Lord, we pray that your grace, mercy, and peace would be with us through Jesus Christ and that we would be a people of truth and of love. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll turn to Psalm 86b. I'm realizing uh, maybe there is a Psalter up here. Psalm 86, selection B. Your way teach me, Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart and my name to fear. We will walk in the truth. We sing in the eighth stanza, Lord, merciful God, full of grace, slow to wrath, abounding in what? Truth and in love. He abounds in truth and love. We will abound as well. Let's stand for 86, selection B. Remain standing for the benediction and the doxology.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said,